It is a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Adrian Yuan. Uh, he did uh, his PhD in 2007, uh, also at UCLA. Uh, uh, now he's a professor at the University of California at San Diego. Uh, and his research interests are in von Neumann algebras, ergodic theory, orbit equivalence, and representation theory of groups. Please. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, it's a great honor to, to give a, a talk here. And thank you all for coming to my talk. Uh, so um, my talk will be a, a report on some recent progress in the study of von Neumann algebras. Uh, so, uh, Van Neumann algebras already appeared in Yasu's talk, but let me go ahead and start with the definition. So, uh, Van Neumann algebra is an algebra of bounded linear operators on a Hilbert space, which is closed under the adjoint, and it's also closed in the weak operator topology. Uh, this is the topology of pointwise convergence of matrix coefficients. So, it's the weakest topology you can really write down. Um, so, uh, as Yasu explained, one way to build von Neumann algebras is to take a collection of operators from the algebra they generate, uh, they, together with their adjoints, generate, and then take the closure in the weak operator topology. Let me give you some basic examples of, of von Neumann algebras that are somewhat more concrete. Uh, so, obviously, the algebra of all bounded operators on H is a von Neumann algebra. Uh, if x mu is a measure space, then ele every L infinity function on x gives me an operator on L2 of x by pointwise multiplication, and this copy of L infinity of x is a von Neumann algebra. Um, another construction goes as follows. If I start with any set of operators which is closed under, under adjoint, then it's commutant, so A prime, this is the set of all operators that commute with every operator in A, is a von Neumann algebra. Uh, and you may think that this is a special way of getting von Neumann algebras, but a beautiful theorem of von Neumann says that any von Neumann algebra is of this type. Uh, so more precisely, he proved that if you take any von Neumann algebra which contains the identity operator, then M is equal to the commutant of its commutant. So in particular, any von Neumann algebra is the commutant of some set of operators. Um, now, these are some very basic examples. The most studied classes, um, some of the most studied classes arise from groups and actions, and those will be the focus of my talk. So let me go ahead uh, and remind you these um, general constructions. So the first construction starts with a countable group gamma, and throughout my talk, all the groups, all, all the most, most groups will be countable, and they will always be denoted by gamma. So if you have a countable group, uh, you can uh, define the so-called group von Neumann algebra L of gamma. Uh, and this is generated by the left regular representation of the group. So what do I mean by that? For every group element G, lambda of G is a unitary operator on the Hilbert space little l2 of gamma, which, on the Dirac, which takes the Dirac mass at H to the Dirac mass at G times H. So this is the natural unitary representation that you get from the left uh, multiplication action of gamma on itself. Okay, so then what you can do is to look at the span of all the lambda Gs. Well, this forms a copy of the group algebra of gamma, and the group von Neumann algebra of gamma is defined as the weak operator closure of C of gamma. Okay, so again, I have the left regular representation, and I'm just taking the closure of the span of it. That is the group von Neumann algebra of gamma. Uh, the second construction uh, associates the von Neumann algebra to every action of a countable group gamma on a probability space X mu. Uh, and the action is assumed to be measure preserving. By that, I mean that for every group element G, you have a transformation of the space which is invertible, measurable, and preserves the measure. So if you have such an action, uh, you can construct the group measure space von Neumann algebra L infinity of X cross gamma. This is generated by a copy of L infinity of X and a copy of the group gamma. 
And the simplest way you, you can define this is to say that uh, these are subject to the following relations. So if I take a unitary lambda g corresponding to a group element uh, g, and I conjugate a function f in L infinity of x, I get another L infinity of x function, which is precisely f composed with uh, the transformation g inverse. Um, and this construction, again, is referred as uh, L infinity of x cross gamma. So it's a cross product construction, which is analogous to the semi-direct product construction for groups with L infinity of x playing the role or an analogous role to, to the normal subgroup in the semi-direct product construction. And one key feature here that both of these classes of algebras have is that they come equipped with a natural trace. So this is an analog of the trace of, of finite matrices. These are infinite dimensional algebras, but they still have a trace. They have a linear functional, which takes the same value at s times t as it does at t times s. So somehow the trace doesn't see uh, commutativity. OK, so these are, these are the constructions uh, that Murr and van Neumann introduced. And um, they motivate the following uh, general question. So the problem is to try to classify uh, L of gamma and L infinity of x cross gamma in terms of the group and the action you're given. And more generally, you can ask, well, to what extent do these algebras remember the group or the action they were constructed from? So if I give you two groups and I tell you that they uh, generate, uh, that their Van Neumann algebras are isomorphic, can you say anything about the relationship between the groups? So this is the sort of question that uh, I'll be looking at. And the first observation here that is that, uh, in general, Van Neumann algebras tend to forget uh, most of the information about the group or the action. And I'll illustrate that with the following remark. So if gamma is an infinite abelian group, then using the Fourier transform, you can show that the Van Neumann algebra of gamma is isomorphic to the L infinity algebra of the 0, 1 interval with the Lebesgue measure. So in other words, if I start with any infinite abelian group, I always end up with the same Van Neumann algebra. So this doesn't depend in any way of the Van Neumann algebra. Of course, this is a trivial, trivial case because when you classify objects, you usually want to restrict to objects that are simple. And you know, these algebras for abelian groups, these are highly non-simple. The, the simple Van Neumann algebras are called factors. Uh, so a factor is a Van Neumann algebra that cannot be decomposed as a direct sum of two Van Neumann algebras. And you remember the algebras I'm interested in also have traces. So once uh, the, al the group algebras or group measure space algebras uh, are factors, they will be two one factors. And this uh, can be defined as an infinite dimensional factor that admits a trace. And now, uh, uh, let me give you a result which tells you exactly when algebras coming from groups or actions are factors, which will be the standing assumption throughout the talk. So for a group algebra L of gamma, L of gamma is a two-one factor if and only if gamma has infinite conjugacy classes. This is a pro property that's abbreviated as ICC, and it means that the conjugacy class of every non-trivial element is infinite. Uh, for L infinity of x cross gamma, we have a nice condition which, gener which uh, guarantees that L infinity of x cross gamma is a one factor, and that is be the fact that the action is both free and ergodic. Uh, free means that um, if you look at almost every point in the space, the stabilizer is trivial. Ergodic means that uh, there are no non-trivial uh, invariant subsets of the space. So these are some natural assumptions on the action. So from now on, whenever I talk about L of gamma, gamma will be a countable ICC group. Whenever I talk about L infinity of x cross gamma, I'm considering free ergodic measure preserving actions. Uh, so what, what are some basic examples of such free ergodic actions? Well, these are the Bernoulli actions. So um, uh, for every countable group gamma, I have a Bernoulli action, which is an action of, on a space of the form x to the power gamma, which uses, again, uh, the left multiplication action of gamma on itself. So um, the, the classification problem that I consider here was already looked at by Murray and van Neumann. And they proved 
uh, two, two important facts. They show that there exists a unique to one factor R, which is in some sense approximately finite dimensional. And this can be constructed as the closure of the infinite tensor product of the two by two matrices. And the second fact they proved is that uh, there are two one factors that are not approximately finite dimensional. They show that the Van Neumann algebra of the free group on two generators is such an algebra. Okay, so these were the original results. Uh, and later on, in the 70s, it became clear that there's a, a very strong dichotomy in the classification problem, depending on whether the group gamma that we have is amenable or not. So uh, let me go ahead and tell you very quickly what this is. Um, so let me remind you one of the many definitions of amenability. So countable group gamma is called amenable if its left regular representation has almost invariant vectors. So this means that there's a sequence of unit vectors in little l2 of gamma, such that as n goes to infinity, lambda of g, the unitary corresponding to g, leaves psi n more and more invariant. Uh, this is a large class of groups. It contains all abelian and solvable groups, uh, and in particular it contains the integers. And one can see right away that the integers are, are um, form an amenable group by just taking the, the characteristic function of the set 1 through n and normalizing it to get a, a unit vector on little l2 of z. And as n goes to infinity, this set 1 through n becomes more and more invariant under translation with group elements, so uh, relative to its size, so you get almost invariant vectors. And the, the main theorem here is due to Kohn, who obtained a complete classification of uh, uh, Van Neumann algebras in the amenable regime. So more precisely, he showed that uh, for every ICC amenable group gamma, L of gamma is isomorphic to R. This is the unique, approximately finite dimensional to one factor. And also for every free ergodic action of an infinite amenable group gamma, the, the, the algebra of L infinity of X cross gamma is also isomorphic to R. So, one way to look at it is to say that this, this really says that amenable groups has, have a str quite striking lack of rigidity. So re any algebraic property of an amenable group, for instance, uh, I said they're being torsion-free or being finitely generated, uh, is lost when you pass the Van Neumann algebras. The Van Neumann algebras only remembers that the group is, uh, is amenable and nothing else. So regardless what amenable group you put in, you always obtain the same Van Neumann algebra. And um, now, uh, once, once the amenable case was settled, the focus shifted to the, uh, the non-amenable case. And already in the 80s, 70s and 80s, it became clear that um, the non-amenable case is a lot, a lot more complex. So uh, uh, in particular, it became clear that there's another representation theoretic property of groups, property T, which is relati uh, relevant to the classification problem. So let me quickly also give you that definition. So uh, a group gamma has Kajdan's property T if any unitary representation of gamma that has almost invariant vectors has non-zero invariant vectors. Remember that amenable groups are precisely those whose left regular representations have almost invariant vectors, and you can check that an infinite group cannot be both uh, amenable and have property T. So property T is a, is a strengthening of being non-amenable. And uh, again, this is a property that's satisfied by many, uh, many groups, including uh, lattices in higher rank simple Lie groups, such as SLNZ with N at least three. And um, the, first, the first rigidity result for, um, for Van Neumann algebras was discovered in, uh, in 1980 by Kohn, who proved the following result. So he showed that if gamma is an ICC property T group, then any automorphism of the Van Neumann algebra L of gamma that is close to the identity is necessarily inner. So this tells you that L of gamma is a very rigid object. I cannot have a one parameter group of automorphisms, all of which are outer. So there, it doesn't admit any any ways to, of moving around. Uh, but despite of this result and several others in, in the 70s and 80s, uh, for a long time the classification was uh, 
largely uh, intractable in the non-aminable case. And um, this, this has changed quite dramatically about 15 years ago uh, with Popa's uh, introduction of uh, deformation rigidity theory. Uh, so let me give you uh, sort of a two-minute uh, explanation of this. So this is a new approach to the study of Van Neumann algebras and Tuan factors. And the idea is to study Tuan factors that have two uh, properties. So Popa assumes that M, the Tuan factor M, has a deformation property. So this really means that M has lots of deformations. For instance, it can mean that M has a one-parameter group of automorphisms, all of which are outer. And the second property is a rigidity property. And this can take the form of property T. So it can mean, for instance, that M contains the Van Neumann algebra of a property T group. Now, uh, Popa's uh, brilliant insight here was to realize that sometimes, by combining these two properties, one can understand the structure of M. So you can put these properties together to prove structure results about M, the automorphisms of M, and classification. So uh, again, this has had many applications. I will focus here on, uh, on some of those applications in the direction of rigidity. So, so I will present several rigidity results. So these are um, results when, um, when you can recover various aspects of the groups and the actions from the Van Neumann algebras. So this will be instances where we'll go in the opposite for the amenable case where nothing is remembered. So, uh, the results that I'll present say the, the very much opposite, that sometimes it is possible to recover the group, the action, partially or entirely from the Van Neumann algebra. All right, so also for the rest of the talk, I will focus separately on results that address Van Neumann algebras of actions and those of groups. And I'll start uh, by looking at Van Neumann algebras of actions. And uh, let me tell you what I mean by rigidity results in that context first. So, uh, I'll need some more terminology. So, let me consider two uh, free ergodic actions of two countable groups, gamma and lambda, again on probability spaces x and y. And I'll introduce now three different ways of comparing such actions. So, first we say that two such actions are conjugate. If there's an isomorphism between the probability spaces, this just means that alpha is a measurable map, which is invertible, and which preserves the measure. It takes mu to nu. And also an isomorphism, a group isomorphism between the groups, such that I have this relation. This relation says that after I identify the spaces and the groups using these isomorphisms, the actions become identical. And conjugacy is a natural notion of isomorphism in this context. So that's conjugacy. The second notion is called orbit equivalence, so two actions are orbit equivalent if I have an isomorphism between the probability spaces which takes the orbits of gamma onto the orbits of lambda. Okay, so uh, here the orbit of gamma consists of all the points of the form g times x where g is in the group gamma. And the third notion that I'm considering is W star equivalence. Well, the W star comes from the fact that uh, Van Neumann algebras are also called W star algebras. So this is precisely saying that two actions are W star equivalent if they're W star algebras, L infinity of X cross gamma and L infinity of Y cross lambda are isomorphic. Uh, let me give you a basic remark here. It's clear that conjugacy implies orbit equivalence because if I have this relation, because delta is an onto group of homomorphism, I will obviously have the second relation. Uh, what's less obvious is that orbit equivalence implies W star equivalence. So already in the 50s, um, Zinger noticed that if you have two free ergodic actions that are orbit equivalent, then the Van Neumann algebras are canonically isomorphic. So I have these three uh, relations of equivalence for, for group actions, one implying two, in, which implies three, and rigidity in, in, the context of, in, in this context um, means really a result which proves that for a class of, of actions, the implications can be reversed. So more precisely, a rigidity result can mean proving that for a class of actions, isomorphism of their Van Neumann algebras implies orbit equivalence or even conjugacy. 
Okay, so so that's the 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 basic. Um, it's not a definition, but this is what I mean about rigidity. So the so let me go ahead and give you some concrete results here. So the I'll start with a with a result of Popa. So this is the the first rigidity theorem which deduces conjugacy of actions from isomorphism of their Van Neumann algebras. So here's what Popa proved in 2004. So let me take gamma to be a property T group and gamma on X be any free ergodic action. And let lambda be an ICC group and lambda on Y be a Bernoulli action. So Popa showed that if the Van Neumann algebras are isomorphic, then the groups gamma and lambda are isomorphic and their actions are conjugate. And the thing to notice here is that Popa assumed this, that the first group has property T and the second action is Bernoulli. So the conditions in the theorem are somewhat asymmetric. And the natural question that underlies this result is, well, can we put all the conditions of, on one of the actions? So can we assume, for instance, that the first action is, an action is a Bernoulli action of a property T group and allow the second action to be arbitrary. And there's a, there's a name for the type of result that that would give you, and that's called W star super rigidity. So an action is called W star super rigid if any, action, any other action lambda on Y, which gives you an isomorphic Van Neumann algebra, is necessarily conjugate to gamma on X. Now, uh, w star again comes from Van Neumann algebras. Why is this super rigidity? Well, this is the strongest type of rigidity result you can write down in this context. It says that if, uh, if the Van Neumann algebra of the first action is isomorphic to the Van Neumann algebra of any action, then the actions are the same. And uh, after Popa's result, um, one of the main focuses in this theory was to, to find examples of uh, W star super rigid actions. Uh, let me go ahead and tell you uh, how this was resolved. So uh, the first examples of uh, super rigid actions were found in 2009. Uh, so first, Jesse Peterson proved the existence of uh, virtually W star super rigid actions. Uh, the first concrete families of uh, super rigid actions were found uh, a little later by Popa and Vass. And they prove, for instance, that Bernoulli actions of many amalgamated free product groups have this property. And again, um, amalgamated free product groups, uh, well, they're disjoint from the class of property T groups. They never have property T. So this doesn't address the question here, but it does give the first examples of uh, W star super rigid actions. And uh, the, the year after, I was able to solve the question coming from, uh, from uh, Popa's work. And I prove the following. So let's take gamma to be any ICC property T group. Um, then the Bernoulli action of gamma on X. And here X is just X naught to the power gamma for any non-trivial probability space X naught mu naught. You can think of X naught mu naught being the 0, 1 interval with the Lebesgue measure. Then this Bernoulli action is W star super rigid. So if I have any ICC property T group, and I have any Bernoulli, of a, a Bernoulli action of it, if another action gives me the same Van Neumann algebra, then the actions are the same. Uh, so what this tells you, going back to the, this sort of uh, question about rigidity, uh, this, this says that for a large family of actions, Bernoulli actions of property T groups, uh, the Van Neumann algebra remembers both the action and the group. Um, and to give you some concrete examples of, uh, of groups to which the theorem applies, so I mentioned before that uh, SLNZ has property T. Well, in order to make, it, to make this a, an ICC group, I have to divide by center. So PSLNZ has property T for N at least three. The theorem also applies to groups that have an infinite normal subgroup with the relative property T. So it also applies to PSLNZ times any ICC group uh, sigma, and also to the semi-direct product z squared cross SL2z. Um, let me also mention that a couple of years after uh, this result, uh, Remy Boutonnet obtained a very nice generalization of it to all mixing Gaussian actions. And uh, so these results here tell you that for, 
for a large class of non-aminable groups, property D groups, uh, we have actions that satisfy this uh, most extreme form of rigidity. So the question is, well, what happens for other non-aminable groups? And I'd like to focus on uh, a specific class of groups, uh, the free groups, which are non-aminable, but also do not have property T. And the first observation here is that if you look at the free group on N generators, this group has no W star super rigid actions. So for the free groups, it's not possible to prove as strong of a result. Uh, the reason for this goes as follows. If you take any action of the free group, this action will be orbit equivalent to uncountably many different actions uh, of the same free group. So in particular, any action of a free group has the same Van Neumann algebra as many other actions. Uh, nevertheless, in a, in a beautiful uh, breakthrough in 2011, uh, Popa and Vass prove the following theorem. So uh, they consider actions of two free groups, Fn and Fm, again, free ergodic actions, and they show that if the ranks of the free groups are different, then the Van Neumann algebras of the actions are non-isomorphic. So in some sense, this theorem tells you that the Van Neumann algebra L infinity of x cross Fn remembers the rank of the free group N. And uh, let me mention that this was known before under uh, some assumptions on one of the actions. It was known before if the action of Fn is rigid by a result of Popa, or if the action is profinite by a result of Ozawa and Popa. The strength of this theorem comes from the fact that there are uh, no assumptions whatsoever on either of the actions. Um, let me also mention that Popa and Vass actually prove um, well, something, something more, so they show that if L infinity of X cross Fn is isomorphic to any Van Neumann algebra of an action lambda on Y, then the two actions are necessarily orbit equivalent. And now, uh, in the case lambda is also a free group, they apply a theorem of Gaboriau to deduce, uh, to deduce this theorem. So more precisely, Gaboriau proved in uh, uh, 99 that if you take two free groups of different ranks, then they never have orbit equivalent actions. The reason being that there's a notion of cost for equivalence relations which remembers the rank of the free group. All right, so, um, so this concludes the, uh, the, the part of the talk about Van Neumann algebras of, uh, of actions. So in the rest of the talk, so again, to, to sort of conclude this, so for actions, we have two types of results, if you want. So there's uh, super rigidity results showing that for certain actions the Van Neumann algebra remembers the group and the action and then there's these other results showing that for the free groups you can remember the rank of the acting free group. In contrast, <laughs> the classification of Van Neumann algebras of groups is much less understood. And I'll try to make this point uh, by mentioning two major open problems in this direction. So. Um, the first problem is called the so-called so the, the free group factor problem. So it's asking whether the Van Neumann algebras of the free groups on N and M generators are isomorphic or not for different values N uh, uh, not equal to M. The second problem, it's asking the same thing for the Van Neumann algebras of the arithmetic groups PSL and Z. So is the Van Neumann algebra of PSL and Z isomorphic to the Van Neumann algebra of PSLMZ for n different than m. And here you may assume that both n and m are at least three. Um, again, these problems are wide open, uh, but uh, nevertheless, they've had uh, a lot of influence on the development of, uh, of, Van, of the theory of Van Neumann algebras. In particular, the first problem uh, has motivated Voiculescu to introduce free probability theory. Uh, while the second problem has motivated a lot of the recent work in, in deformation rigidity theory. In fact, uh, the second problem is predicted to have, I guess, a positive answer by a general conjecture of Kohn. So you remember that SLNZ and PSLNZ have property T when S N is at least three. Well, Kohn conjecture in 1980 that if gamma and lambda are any ICC property T groups, then the Van Neumann algebras are isomorphic if and only if the groups are isomorphic. So the conjecture says that for 
property T groups, such as S, L, and Z, isomorphism of the Van Neumann algebras should be the same as isomorphism of the groups. And um, a few years after this conjecture, Cohn and Jones proved that property T is an invariant of L of gamma. What do I mean by that? So one consequence of the result is that if gamma has property T, and L of gamma is isomorphic to L of lambda, then lambda also has property T. So consequence of this, one consequence of this fact is that in Cohn's rigidity conjecture, I only need to assume that one of the groups has property T. So I can reformulate this conjecture as a super rigidity problem. So, so the result of, ah. So Cohn and Jones's result implies that Cohn's conjecture can be reformulated as follows. Any ICC property T group gamma is W star super rigid, meaning that for any group lambda, which gives, um, so the meaning that any group lambda which gives an isomorphic Van Neumann algebra has to be isomorphic to gamma. Uh, let me say that Cohn's conjecture is wide open. There is currently not a single example of, uh, of, uh, of a property T group that is W star super rigid. And in fact, the, the first examples of uh, W star super rigid groups were only obtained um, several years ago uh, in joint work with, uh, with Popa and Vass. Uh, so uh, let me describe the, the construction that we found. So we found a class of non-aminable groups which don't have property T. Uh, these are generalized reef product groups but which are W star super rigid. Uh, so the way our construction starts is with uh, any non-aminable group G naught and any infinite aminable group S. So G naught can be the, f the free group on uh, two generators, S can be the group of integers. Uh, so with these two groups, we can form the so-called Reef product. So take the direct sum of G naught indexed by the, the group S, S acts on this, by permuting the copies of G naught, and the corresponding semi-direct product group is the, the reef product of G naught with S. Now, the second thing we do is to consider the action of G, of this new group, on the coset space G mod S. So G acts on G mod S by left multiplication, and with this action, we can construct a W star super rigid group. So, um, so gamma is defined as the, the following semi-direct product, so take the uh, so take infinitely many copies of the group with two elements, Z mod 2Z, uh, index over the coset space I. Again, G acts on I, so G will also act on this infinite abelian group by permuting the copies of Z mod 2Z. And what we prove is that the, the resulting semi-direct product group is W star super rigid. Again, this is a complicated construction, but it's a general one. It starts with any non-aminable group and any aminable group. So again, it's a, it's, it's a large family of groups that turn out, so this again says um, that for a large family of groups, the Van Neumann algebra completely remembers the group. So again, W star super GT here means that whenever L of gamma is isomorphic to L of lambda, lambda has to be isomorphic to gamma. So, um, in a strong sense, this says that L of gamma remembers the group gamma. All right, so, so again, here uh, we, we have a family of groups which satisfy the, the, the strongest type of rigidity you can expect for, for, for Van Neumann algebras of groups. In general, you can only expect to recover partial information about the group from the Van Neumann algebra. And the question is, what partial information can you recover? So this is the, the question that I like to pose. So uh, what algebraic properties of a group gamma are remembered by the Van Neumann algebra L of gamma? And we've seen again that if gamma is amenable, the answer is no properties of the group. If the group is non-aminable, well, sometimes it can be the whole group. Um, so in the rest of the, my talk, I'll give you several results which address this question and give instances when various properties of, of groups can be recovered from the Van Neumann algebra. And I'll start with something that at first uh, might look a little bit unrelated to this, and that's to talk about prime to one factors. Uh, so let me recall the definition here. A uh, 2-1 factor M is called prime 
if it is not a tensor product of two to one factors m1 and m2. If you don't know how to take the tensor product of one Neumann algebras, that's okay. Uh, the only thing that I, I'll, I'll emphasize here is that if gamma is the product of two groups, gamma 1 times gamma 2, then the Van Neumann algebra L of gamma is the tensor product of L of gamma 1 with L of gamma 2. So if you can prove that L of gamma is prime, then that means that gamma is not a product group. So proving that L of gamma is prime is stronger, and in fact, much stronger than proving that the group is not a product group. And to sort of give you an idea of how much stronger this is, uh, group Van Neumann algebras were around since 1930s, and uh, the first example of a prime uh, group Van Neumann algebra, a countable group, was found in 96. So uh, Li Ming used Foucault-Lescu's free entropy uh, theory to show that the Van Neumann algebra of the free group on n generators are prime for any integer n at least two. And again, this shows that all the free group factors are prime. Um, the first general result in this direction is due to Ozawa, uh, which, uh, who in 2003 proved that if gamma is any ICC hyperbolic group or any ICC lattice in a simple Lie group of rank one, then L of gamma is prime. So this shows that L of gamma is prime for a huge class of groups, the class of all ICC hyperbolic groups. And um, after these initial results, there were several other classes of, of prime to one factors. I will just mention two other results. Uh, so the first is due to Jesse Peterson, who proved that if gamma is an ICC group which has a positive first to L to Betty number, then L of gamma is prime. And I also mentioned the result of Popa, who found a new approach based on deformation rigidity to primeness of L of Fn. So these results here give us lots of examples of countable groups gamma such that L of gamma is prime. Uh, but let me point out that in all of these examples, the groups are either, well, free, hyperbolic, lattices in, uh, of rank one, or groups with a positive first to L to Betty number. So all of the groups treated here are in some sense related to rank one lattices. And, um, it's, a, it's an important prob open problem to prove that uh, Van Neumann algebras coming from higher rank lattices are also prime. So let me state this as a conjecture. So the conjecture has two parts. The first is to prove that if M is at least three, then the Van Neumann algebra of PSLMZ is prime. And more generally, one would like to prove that the Van Neumann algebra of any irreducible lattice is prime. So this, the, the second part of the conjecture is to show that L of gamma is prime for any ICC reducible lattice, gamma, uh, which sits as a lattice in a product G of N simple Lie groups. And uh, I will not explain for now. So again, a lattice here in a Lie group just means a, a discrete subgroup of finite covolume. Irreducible means that um, the lattice is really not a product of lattices. And more precisely, whenever you, you factor onto a proper subproduct of the Gs, you get a dense subgroup. Uh, but rather than, than put this on a slide, I'll give you specific examples of irreducible lattices. Now, let me mention that uh, Ozawa's result already addresses this conjecture in one case. So the case it does uh, address is when n is 1, so I have one factor, and G1 is a simple Lie group of rank 1. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, with um, two of my former PhD students, uh, Dream Ben Hoff, we managed to settle this conjecture for an arbitrary number of, uh, of uh, factors here, but again under the assumption that G1, G2, Gn are of rank 1. So this is the, the result we proved. So this is with Dream Ben Hoff. Uh, so let G be a product of N simple Lie groups of rank 1. And let gamma in G be any ICC reducible lattice. Uh, then L of gamma is a prime to one factor. So again, the sort of the strength of the theorem is that I can assume any finite number of uh, simple Lie groups, but they all have to be of rank one. Um, and now it's a good moment maybe to give you some examples of irreducible lattices. Uh, so if you have a simple Lie group, any lattice is irreducible. There's only one. Um, Lie group. If you have, um, 
so SLM Z sits as a, it's an irreducible lattice in SLMR for M at least two. Now in SLMR times SLMR, I have the lattice SLM Z times itself, but this is a, a product lattice. Uh, to get an example of an irreducible lattice, uh, one can consider, for instance, the, uh, the arithmetic group SLM over the ring, Z, to which I join square root of D, and here I'm taking D to be a square-free integer, which is not congruent to, uh, to 1 mod 4. Okay, so now in our assumption, G1, G2, Gn have to be of rank 1, so in particular the theorem applies when G1, G2, Gn are all equal to SL2R. So, uh, so as a corollary, we get that um, the Van Neumann algebra of the group PSL2 of Z adjoint square root of D, where D is again as here, is a prime to one factor. Again, the P, I, I have to use PSL instead of SL because uh, the groups have to be ICC. Uh, so this, this gives the, the, the first examples of prime to one factors that come from, um, from higher rank lattices. And again, I've given you lots of examples of, of uh, results which give two one factors that are prime and come from countable groups. And you may wonder how, how does this connect to the, to the rigidity theorem of, of my talk. So um, I already mentioned that if L of gamma is prime, then gamma is not a product of infinite groups. So in a way, if, so if I can show that L of gamma is prime, that means that whenever L of gamma is isomorphic to any L of lambda, lambda is also not a product of infinite groups. So in some sense, proving prime, primeness allows me to say that L of gamma remembers that gamma is not a product group. It remembers the absence of a product decomposition for gamma. So, um, and I'll finish with two results. So this gives you, a, if you want, the first algebraic property of, of countable groups, which is uh, sometimes remembered by the Van Neumann algebras. And I'll give you two other results in this direction. Um, so the first is due to Kifan uh, de Santiago and Sinclair from uh, a few years ago. So here's what they show. So let gamma be the product of n ICC hyperbolic groups. Uh, so for instance, you can take gamma to be a product of non-abelian free groups. Okay, so you can take gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma n, all to be the free group on two generators. Uh, so they prove that if L of gamma is isomorphic to L of lambda, for any group lambda, then the group lambda has to be itself a product of n infinite groups. Okay, so let me make a remark. This theorem is optimal in the sense that you cannot go any further than this. Uh, you cannot show that lambda has to be isomorphic to gamma. In fact, there's lots of groups lambda, all of which has to be, have to be products, which give you the same Van Neumann algebra as gamma. But what they do show is that any group lambda that gives you an isomorphic Van Neumann algebra has to be of product type. So this result, in some sense, tells you that L of gamma remembers the product structure of gamma. It remembers that gamma is a product group. All right, and the, the very last result I'll mention um, is a joint work with Yonutsky Fan from last year where we showed that in certain situations also the amalgamated free product structure can be remembered uh, by, the, by the Van Neumann algebra. So for a class of amalgamated free product groups, so this is gamma is the amalgam of gamma one with gamma two over a common subgroup sigma, uh, we have the following. So if L of gamma is isomorphic to the Van Neumann algebra of any group lambda, then lambda itself has to be an amalgamated free product group. Of course, any group is a trivial amalgamated free group, uh, free product group, uh, but this, this decomposition is non-trivial. What we prove is that in fact, the Van Neumann algebra of the peripheral subgroups, gamma one and lambda one, have to be pairwise isomorphic. So in fact, the, uh, the parts of the amalgamated free product have to have some relationship. So again, uh, one way to phrase this is to say that the Van Neumann algebra of gamma remembers that gamma is an amalgamated free product group. It remembers the amalgam structure of gamma. So again, I think this is uh, all I have to say and uh, thank you for listening and I'll stop here.
Thank you, Prof Professor Viana. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you. Uh, so basically, all the results uh, in the second part of your talk about a single equivalence relation. If you look at a small category of countable groups, uh, gamma is equivalent to lambda if and only if the group factors are isomorphic. Right, mm -hmm. I mean, free group factor isomorphism problem. Is there anything about the equivalence relation, some sort of a global question about it that, that, that makes sense? Saying something about the classification of group van Neumann algebras, um, I'm sure it's not classified by, by countable structures. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I cannot tell you the sp specific result, but okay. yeah. thank you. Any other questions? In a situation when L of gamma remembers some information, that's not the same as saying it would tell you that information. Do you have ways of reading off that information sometimes? For example, the N in this case? So, so what do you mean exactly? So in, in the, you're referring to the first result or second or either? Yeah, I, I give you a group and, and I say this, this is uh, super rigid and you have to take my word for it, but can you then reconstruct the group? Ah. I, I, I give you, I give you the, the phenomenon algebra, but can you read off the group? Right. Um, well, it depends what it means to reconstruct. So if you have a super rigid group, you have gamma, you give me L of gamma, well, the proof of super rigidity goes by saying that if there's any other countable group which generates this, <laughs> through its left regular representation, then it has to be one. And it's actually canonical. I should say that uh, all these theorems are canonical, not only that you get an abstract isomorphic or, uh, isomorphism between gamma and the other group lambda, but in fact, it's, once you identify the algebras, it's, uh, it's given by a unitary. But, but to reconstruct the group this way, you would have to go through all the groups and see which one it is. I mean, is there a systematic way of extracting this group? Right. Uh, or some information, for example, in, in this case, is there a way to recover the n? Is there a way to what? The, the number n in this product. Is there a way to recapture that? Yeah. Um, so, let's see. Yes. So, but these are tip, different types of results. So, n here is, is by a result of Ozawa and Popa, another result of Ozawa and Popa from 2004. n is the maximal number of, uh, of a tensor product decomposition for L of gamma. Okay, so that's independent of any other group. If, if you have a super rigid uh, factor, can you say anything about the sub-factor sub structure? Um, there isn't any direct connection, as far as I know. If you, if a group is W star super rigid, to say something about the finite index subfactors of L of gamma. However, uh, the methods usually go through are powerful enough so that when you can prove such a result, you probably can classify all uh, automorphisms and sometimes even all endomorphisms. So there are results like that. So when it's somehow the W star super rigid require more technology than uh, than um, unraveling the, the endomorphisms, even. Any other questions? If not, let's take the speaker again. <laughs>